Thanks, Pastor Dave. Thanks to the Whites for participating in that. It's a really great picture of, uh, of these two kind of families coming together. Uh, we can view the church in any number of different ways. You could view it as a lighthouse. You could view it as a hospital. Um, but one of the very essential ways that we view the church in a literal sense is as a family. That's why we love our kids, pray for the kids, want our kids to you know, grow up in a church liking church and enjoying church and it being a safe place. And so kids, if you're in the room and you'd like to go downstairs, you can do that now. Um, the Bible says that when we come to faith in Christ, we're adopted by the Father, that Jesus is our older brother, and he is the one who has brought us into this new family. And it's a beautiful picture because it means that regardless of your family situation, you're a part of the family when you're part of the church. And that entrance into the church comes by confession of faith in Jesus. And, and, and we're given these, these rights and privileges as children, as sons and daughters, to, to approach our Father with confidence, to uh, uh, be brought into worship by our elder brother, Christ. Uh, we're given all of these rights and privileges, including an inheritance. The church is God's family, and it's an eternal family, and it's something that we celebrate. So as much as we come alongside families within the church, the families, the church does not exist for families. Families are a part of the church, and we're all working towards the same goal, which is the gospel being preached and the kingdom coming here on earth until Jesus returns. Um, it's an important but necessary and necessary distinction to make. Subtle, I know, but, but it allows us to really understand what we're doing here, right? What we're doing here. In fact, that's why we're doing this series right now called Why We Do What We Do. If you have a Bible, I'm going to invite you to turn to Acts chapter 2. We're doing this series. Pastor Andy kicked it off last week with uh, uh, answering the question, why we pray. Uh, today, we're going to look and ask the question, why we baptize, right? Because maybe you asked this morning, hey, why don't you baptize babies here? Anybody? No one's, everyone's scared to raise their hands. Right? We're going to ask a whole bunch of questions like that. Why do we sing? Why do we preach? Why do we take communion every week? Uh, why do we uh, um, gather together at all to begin with? And, and so I hope that if you're new to our church, this allows you to understand some of the reasons behind everything we do at SCC. And as you are aware of it, uh, and it makes sense to you, and you can have some of your questions answered, uh, you may choose to uh, identify with us as a family. That's kind of why we're doing this series here. And, and we're really, really glad um, for all of you who are new that you're, you're willing to kind of journey along with this. This is an interesting, it's an interesting series because it's bringing up a lot of questions where we just assumed everybody agreed on stuff, um, but not always. Did you know that not everybody agrees on everything? I know, crazy, right? I know. Your th the real world is not like your Facebook groups, right? It's strange how that works, eh? Facebook's not the real world. You can write that down. You could put that in your Facebook and uh, make that your status. So let's ask that question. Hey, why don't you baptize babies here? Well, apart from the reason that I just gave you about how we view family and the church's family, the, the very simple answer to that question is because we're a Baptist church. Some of you are like, this is a Baptist church? <laughs> yeah, the lack of clapping didn't give it away. I, um, sorry. And others of you are like, what's a Baptist church? Well, I'm going to hopefully answer a little bit of those kind of questions along the way. A little bit of background, though, on our church is that this church is actually 114 years old. Right? That's an old, long, long time. Uh, moved its way from downtown all the way up, was known up until about 12 years ago as First Regular Baptist Church of Salmon Arm, right? Now, that's a big web domain. Um, First Regular Baptist Church of Salmon Arm, and about 12 years ago, we decided for various reasons, not the least of which, was that it was maybe time to change the name because it's hard to understand what all those different things mean. Back in the day when pioneers were settling and, and cities were being formed, there would be uh, churches established, and they would be known by their denomination, you know, uh, Reform or Baptist or Pentecostal or Catholic or so on and so forth. And, and in these certain towns, these, these groups would gather together, but they would know that, hey, this is probably not going to be 
the last Baptist church in town. Right? So they would say, we are the first Baptist church in town. So if someone was moving to town and they were looking for a Baptist church, they might like to go to the first one as opposed to the second one. <laughs> no, I'm serious, right? And if you go back east, you see that kind of play itself out, right? There's different names of different churches according to the time that they were established in regards to how they split or divided or whatever. When we were looking at it a few years ago, we realized that a name change might be appropriate, that what we wanted to be was a church that existed for the community and identified with the community, and so we chose Shushwap Community Church. But we never stopped being a Baptist church. That's why we practice baptism. If you've been a part of our church even for the last few months, maybe you saw us when we baptized uh, some people in this back tank here. So behind this curtain is a basically almost a big hot tub, all right? And uh, we fill it up with water. Carol, our custodian, spends 12 hours stirring it with a boat oar because she's really worried I'm going to be upset or one of the pastors is going to be upset because it's too cold. Though we would never get upset with Carol, but she's so diligent to make sure, how was the water today? Was it too hot? Was it too cold? No, the water was great, Carol. But that's her service. That's her ministry. Those are the things she cares about. And so uh, when people ask to be baptized, we fill up that tank and we baptize them. We ask them if they are um, believers in Jesus. We ask them to renounce the devil in all of his ways. And we ask them to partner with the church. And when they answer yes to those questions, we baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is something that has been happening since just after Jesus ascended up into heaven. And I'd like to take you to the passage that I believe establishes the pattern for the practice of baptism in the church. And some of you are like, isn't it Mother's Day? And we're talking about baptism? I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> but we've got some special things later. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is a very, very um, significant um, passage in the Bible because, as I mentioned, Jesus has ascended up into heaven. He's commissioned the disciples. He's told them to be on mission. He said the Holy Spirit will come and will move in you and will empower you to preach the gospel and by that will establish my church on the earth until I return Jesus has ascended up into heaven. He sits at the Father, and that's exactly what happens. He sends the Holy Spirit, and it fills the disciples. Fills the disciples, and they begin proclaiming, speaking the gospel in languages that, that none of them are native speakers of. And because Jerusalem and the temple of Jerusalem was a place where many foreigners would come, they were hearing these men preaching the gospel message, the same gospel message, in different languages. And they were wondering, what is this? This is incredible. How could this be happening? So Peter, uh, kind of the, the main apostle, if you were, preaches a sermon, and he tells them, we're talking about Jesus. And he uses the Old Testament and, and proclaims the gospel to the people there. And what happens next and over the next couple of chapters is very, very important for us as we seek to be a faithful church because it's the passages of Scripture that, that show us how Jesus establishes his church. So what happens after Peter preaches this gospel message? Acts chapter 2, verse 37. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what should we do? What's happening? The gospel's got inside of them. They're moved by it. They can't believe that Jesus, who maybe some of them knew or had at least heard of, died for sin. That his physical death was a spiritual movement. And they say, what should we do? Verse 38, Peter replies, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he testified and strongly urged them, saying, Be saved from this corrupt generation. So those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. This is God's word. The gospel is preached, and the people who hear it have a movement of both their mind and of their heart. They're convinced. They're convinced that Jesus is the Son of God. They're convinced that Jesus was more than just a human, but that he was divine. He was the Messiah. They're convinced of it. But in being convinced, they're also convicted. They recognize that in their own life, they have not lived up to the example that Christ has set. 
And they see the love of God poured out for them when Jesus died for their sins. And they're convicted in their hearts and they don't know what to do. This is how we know the gospel is preached when people go, whoa, what do I do with this? What does Peter say? Repent and be baptized. And in so doing, he establishes a pattern by which people come to Christ, identify as believers, and enter into the church. So three things about baptism that I want to launch out on from this passage. First of all, baptism is spiritual. It's primarily a spiritual work. It's an internal work. Paul, the Apostle Paul, who um, was maybe the greatest theological thinker and has written uh, uh, in the New Testament um, that which we look to for kind of uh, doctrine and for truth about how we should believe, what we should believe, and then what we should live into, writes this in Romans 4 about the work of God in our hearts. Romans 6, 4 says this, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father, we might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. He's talking about a spiritual reality. That when we confess faith in Jesus, when we repent of our sins, our old person dies. The person we were, dead. But there's a movement in our heart by the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that brought Jesus back from the dead, brings our spirits back from the dead. So we've been united with him in a death like his, so that we could also one day be united with him in a resurrection like his. So the Christian believes this, that when we come to faith in Jesus, we're living a new life. We are a new creation. And one day, that, that spiritual reality will become our physical reality when we'll be resurrected from the dead. That's our hope, right? That's our hope. That what is happening in us spiritually will happen to us physically. But it begins spiritually. The New Testament makes it clear that salvation happens on the basis of faith. Okay? That the moment we repent, we're baptized into Christ's death. That this spiritual movement is what takes place. And here's what's really important. It reminds us that our salvation is not of our own doing. Christ pursues. Christ reveals. Christ saves. It's the revelation of God that leads us to repentance. But it's the revelation of God that God takes responsibility for. So when the disciples are preaching the gospel, they're doing it by the movement of the Holy Spirit. Right? Right? Because it's God who is drawing people to himself in salvation. So we say baptism is, first of all, a spiritual reality. And our salvation is complete, is assured when we place our faith in Christ for salvation. So just basically all that to say, the baptism, the physical act, does not save you. But we do see that shortly after repentance in Acts 2, it becomes physical. 3,000 people joined the church that day. That means 3,000 people were baptized that day. How did they do all of that? They're in the middle of the desert, right? They're at the temple. They're in the, kind of the middle of the desert. Water's a very rare thing. But they've got all over Jerusalem what they call mikvahs, which are these big baptistries, baptist, baptismal tanks, full of gross, dirty water. Right? It was basically rainwater or water that they paid to bring in. And, and you can go there now and you can walk into them by walking down a few sets of stairs. And there's a tank there and then there's another set of stairs that comes up the other side. And the Jews of the day, before they would worship in the temple, would come after their travels and they would be very, very dirty. So they would buy brand new clothes because you couldn't go worship God in the temple covered in dirt. Right? And they would go and they would walk into the baptistry, the mikvah, and they would dunk themselves three times, right? They would walk out and put on their new clothes and go to worship, right? And every year they would do this. So there were these places, these mikvahs, these baptistries all over the place. But in those moments, they weren't given to the Jews, right? The Christians took them over. And they all went and they were baptized once for all in the name of Jesus. Okay? Their spiritual reality 
became a physical demonstration. Paul alludes to this a little bit in Colossians chapter 2. You can turn there if you want. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. He says this, You were also circumcised in Christ with a circumcision not done with hands by putting off the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ when you were buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Paul takes a very physical metaphor, circumcision, and says when you come to faith in Christ, you're circumcised in your heart. And that's a picture of baptism. And he leads it, he leads it like this. He says, no longer is it physical to begin with. Right? The Jews would be circumcised. Then they would come to an awareness of a faith in God. Then they would practice their religion and their worship. Right? It's, Paul is saying it's the other way around now. It begins spiritual, and it plays itself out physically. And, and what would be different in, in kind of as the, the picture of baptism would develop is that they, they would do their baptism differently than the Jews would. Instead of doing it every year, you would do it one time. Because once and for all, when you do it in the name of Jesus, in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, it's a once and for all time thing. It would be a picture of what Jesus did on the cross and the next day when he was buried and on the third day when he was raised from the dead. And it would be done with assistance, right? So now when we baptize, someone walks into the tank or the water, the lake or the river or where the ocean, anywhere there's a body of water, and we tilt them backwards. We ask them to blow out their nose, right? Because we've almost lost some people. (laughs) They breathed in. We had one of our dear old saints way back in the day. She breathed in. She was about 85 years old, and we almost saw her just enter heaven that morning, same morning. Um, It wasn't that bad. I shouldn't say it was that bad. Um, And then we bring them out of the water. It's this beautiful picture of what Christ has done for us. And when somebody's doing it, they're doing with their body. What they're doing with their body is identifying with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. It becomes a physical thing. The third thing, and this is no small thing, is that it's communal, that it's done within community. At the very end, we read that little verse in 41 of Acts chapter 2. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and, about, and that day, about 3,000 people were added to them. So people repented, were baptized, and joined the church. They joined the church. Acts 2.42, the next verse, is the verse that we often hold up as the picture of the ideal church, where we read that the people, this group of baptized believers, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And there's this great description going on there about what the church looks like. It would have been very rare for people to be a part of the church and not be baptized. It would be very, very rare We know that you enter into the family of God, that you enter into the universal church whenever you place your faith in Christ upon your repentance. But locally, you enter into the local church kind of by your baptism, where you're saying, I want everybody to know that I'm a follower of Christ and that I'm joining with the mission of the church given to us by Christ himself and submitting him to his lordship by partnering with the church in that mission. In that, they're basically saying, hold me accountable, right? I invite you into my life to encourage me, support me, and hold me accountable for the witness that I've given today in my baptism. It's a public declaration to the church, inviting the church to be a part of their lives. Did you know that? It's, it's really, really important because it's, this is what we actually go to when we're concerned about people, that when we see something in their life that isn't measuring up, that is a destructive pattern, that is, is uh, uh, unrepentant sin, that is dysfunction, that, that really causes us concern because it's bringing pain into their lives but also affecting their witness. We come and we say, hey, we're really worried about you. And, you know, we're looking at your life and it's not measuring up with your commitment that you made at your baptism and we want to know how to help you, Right? Because they've done that publicly, we're holding them accountable for that. It's one of the same reasons why marriage ceremonies matter, right? When you come to a wedding ceremony and you witness a marriage, you're participating, you're committing to participating in that marriage. Crazy thought. Absolutely crazy thought, right? 
But there's this, there's this communal aspect to the whole thing. So as a Baptist church, in order to be a member of our church, which we're going to talk about in a few weeks, we ask you to tell us the story of your baptism, right? We ask you to tell the story of your baptism because it's communal and that that's what we look to for um, people um, to be held accountable by. Does that make sense? And you see how it kind of progresses? Spiritual, physical, communal. The rights and privileges of salvation are given to us upon our confession, and I don't want to minimize that. It's very, very important. A couple weeks ago, I was at uh, Miller Grad. Carson DeVries, one of uh, uh, a friend of mine, a friend of my kids, uh, going to be on staff with us in an internship. He was graduating from Miller, and it was cool. You ever been to a grad, college grad? They're a little long, i got to admit, okay? And all the Miller guys aren't here today, so I'm just going to say it. They're a little long, but they're kind of awesome because these students have done all of this work over three, four, five, sometimes six years to get to this place where they can celebrate their graduation. The ceremony is always after the exams, right? It's always after the exams. So when are the rights and the privileges given to the grads? When they're done all the work. And in their case, that, you know, the last exam was on the Monday and the grad was on the Friday. I can't remember the exact days, but you get how it works, right? It's kind of how baptism is. When we place our faith in Jesus, when we place our faith in Jesus, we're given the rights and the privileges as sons and daughters belonging to the family of God, and in our baptism, it's celebrated. It's celebrated that way. I remember my college graduation was a little bit different. Um, uh, it was a great day. Um, my whole family was there. We got all dressed up. I got to wear one of those cool cap and gown things. And we walk up on stage and they announce your name and they give you your diploma, right? The folder. And you shake the president's hand and you go back. And I remember sitting down in my seat, can't waiting, and opening up my folder and it said, you are nine credits short <laughs> of your degree. So they would let us walk and celebrate even though we hadn't gotten it. Kind of like pedo baptism. Just saying, not saying. Right? You gotta finish the work before you can celebrate the no one got my joke. <laughs> no, or they're super offended, Sandy. And now it's awkward in this room. <laughs> we really believe that salvation is a spiritual work of God for the individual. And God reveals himself, that he invites us into community, into his family, upon our repentance in recognizing his love for us as demonstrated in the cross. And then we, in response to that him, are baptized and join the church. There's lots of great reasons to be baptized. But we've also come across some reasons why people weren't baptized at times. I remember one man saying, uh, I'd love to be baptized. Um, I've been a Christian for 62 years but I don't read very well. Do I have to read anything? Like, no. You know, other people have said, well, I, I'm so scared of public speaking, so I'm not going to be baptized. Guess what? You don't have to. We would love to hear your story, but you don't have to be baptized. You know what a lot of people do around here is they're like, hey, I want to be baptized, but it's winter. Do you know why that matters? Because they have this picture of doing it in the lake, Right? And that's kind of cool. I get it. Though you can't hear what anybody's saying down there. And not everybody goes to the lake, so it's never really with the whole church, right? That's why I prefer the tank here, because we're all together, you know, and we're doing it as a part of worship, and you can hear stuff because we can mic it, but the pictures aren't as good as when we do them at Canoe Beach. But what ends up happening is there's a drift that takes place, and they're like, I'll do it in the summer. I'll do it next summer. I'll do it next summer. There's any number of different reasons why you wouldn't. Those are maybe not some of the best ones, but I thought maybe it would be appropriate to, to share some of the reasons why someone shouldn't be baptized, some good reasons why they shouldn't. The first is, if you're not willing to submit to the lordship of Jesus, we believe that Jesus is our Lord and our Savior. But I've noticed that people are really keen to accept him as their Savior, but a little resistant to accept him as their Lord, right? And Jesus, they would really like him to be a buddy or a life coach or an advisor, 
But a lord, a king, eh, that means I got to change stuff. We become, we are baptized because Jesus says those who enter the kingdom enter it by water and by the Spirit. And part of our baptism is, is, is being obedient to Christ. And if you're not willing to submit to the lordship of Jesus, then you shouldn't do it. My prayer is, though, that as Christ begins to reveal himself to you, that you would see that, that he is the king and kings and the lord of lords. And that because he was that, he was able to defeat your enemies on the cross. And then in submitting to his lordship is how you find freedom and victory. You shouldn't be baptized if you're not prepared for an attack on your faith. I've been thinking a lot about this, but Jesus, when he was baptized, immediately went into the desert and was um, confronted by Satan. For 40 days, tempted, Satan tempted him and tested him. And, and it got me thinking that baptism in a physical sense is a declaration not just to other people, but to the spiritual realm that you're a believer and that sometimes Satan is going to take a run at you on the basis of your baptism, right? Satan can't get inside your heart. He can't see your mind when you're in Christ. He is going to try to test your faith to destroy your faith. And when he sees you be baptized, that might very well happen. If you aren't willing to accept the cost, this is, this is a big one. And, and what I mean by that is because it's a public declaration, you're letting the church know. You're also letting your family know. And I know for many who come from different traditions, especially traditions where they do baptize infants, this can be a really, really big deal and a hard thing. Where the family doesn't understand why you would choose as an adult to be baptized when you were already baptized. It's one of those subtle things that we do a little bit differently when we say we're going to do family dedications as opposed to even baby dedications because it's the parents that are involved in the teaching and the raising up of children in the faith and their sincerity is a declaration of commitment to them. Other traditions do it through baptism, but the baptism of an infant doesn't save that child, okay? You can email me at ben at a place to belong .ca, and I will send you volumes of Baptistic confessions of faith and theology. The last one, if you aren't ready to partner with the church, and this is a really big one because it's a really, really hard thing. Being a part of a church is not always fun. Did you know that? It's not always a good time. Do you know why? Because church is made up of people. And you know what the problem with people? Is they're sinners. And they do stuff that hurt you. But we believe this, that for some reason, Christ has chosen to reach the world through the church. And that in inviting us into his family, he's also given us a directive. And that we're meant to work together to reach our communities in the name of Christ. That we are obedient, not just in being baptized, but obedient to that commission where Jesus says, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so we try to work together to do that, right? We try to support one another, encourage one another, come alongside one another, give of our time and of our resources to one another, believing that, that Christ, in whatever way, probably because we are weak and because we are broken and because we're flawed, show his glory through this crazy, messed up thing called the church. But entry into the church, as many of you know, often, often brings about some pain and heartache because the expectations we have of Christians are often unmet. And if you're not willing to kind of go down that road, then maybe you shouldn't be baptized. At the end of it all, though, baptism is this radical obedience, an act of worship that Christ is involved in. It's not a means of salvation, but it is a means of grace. Here's what I mean by that. That when someone decides to be baptized, when someone makes that decision to tell the world, I'm a follower of Jesus, and I'm going to live on his mission and seek 
to find victory in my faith that when they say that, they're testifying to some crazy mystery. It's this mystery. Jesus is still working. You don't come to the place where you're willing to make this public declaration without a movement of the living God. No one decides this on their own, right? And, and, and when we witness them, we're witnessing a means of grace. And everybody who's watching it is seeing, yeah, Jesus is still alive. And he's still changing people. He's still working. He's still delivering. He's still changing everything. Christ is still working. Every time we remember his death on our behalf and testify to our trust and our faith in him for salvation, and every time someone decides to tell the world, I'm a follower of Jesus, man, you don't do that if God isn't working. If Christ isn't on his throne, and if he isn't sending the Holy Spirit, then there would be no reason for anybody to be baptized. It is not this emotionally high thing. It is a movement of God, of his spirit, because Jesus is still alive and he's still working. It's a means of grace, and it's a beautiful and powerful thing. I lay that all out for you because it's not the only means of grace that we take together. We believe with all of our heart, that Christ has brought us into God's family, that his death was sufficient to pay the penalty for our sins so that we could know God as our Father. And every Sunday, we try to remember that because we need to experience that grace as often as possible. That's why we take communion, and I'm going to invite you as we continue to worship and meditate and think about what Christ is doing in our hearts and doing in our world, that we would, we would take very seriously what it means for him to be our Lord and our Savior. This past week, maybe you're like me, but I've doubted that. I've wondered if I'm a child of God. I've struggled with the distance, the distance that I've felt between me and God. And that was, that's what makes me very thankful that we have the chance to remember that it's not me who's responsible for my salvation. So I can't lose it. And it's not me who's responsible for Christ's nearness and his presence. Jesus did enough. Baptism is a once-for-all-time thing where we tell the world, yeah, I'm a believer, I'm a follower of Jesus. And we experience the movement of grace in our lives and everybody witnessing it does. But this is our regular occurrence. We remember that Jesus' body was broken for us. That Jesus' blood was spilt for us. So that we could know that we could be saved from our sin. And we could be children of the living God. I'm going to pray. The team's going to come up. We're going to worship. Uh, and I would just invite you to just let the Holy Spirit speak. To look again at the cross to confess and repent of sin, to ask God to help you. And by eating and drinking in remembrance of him, you're placing your faith and your dependence on him for everything in life and for godliness. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we bow before you today, we thank you for your baptism into death, for your death and burial that made it possible for us to have the hope of resurrection have the hope of salvation. Lord, in our confession of that truth, we rest in your grace. I've sinned this week, Lord. I've thought evil thoughts. I have not fulfilled my responsibilities. I've done good things for selfish reasons, and I repent of that. And I thank you for the forgiveness which reminds me that your grace is sufficient and your power is made perfect in, in my weakness and in our weakness. And as we eat the bread, we remember that it was your body broken for us that took the penalty for our sin. That as we drink the cup, we remember that it was your blood spilled for us that made forgiveness possible. And in this moment right now, as we submit to you as our Savior, we also submit to you as our Lord. In your name and for your glory, I pray. Amen.
Let's stand together. And if uh, you'd like to take communion this morning, you're more than welcome to do that if you're a child of God, if you place your faith in Jesus for salvation. Take some time and just meditate on these things. Take it back to your seat. Open it up. Pray, think, repent, confess, and, and, and eat and drink in full assurance of what Jesus had done and experienced his grace this morning.